Hello students, myself Dr. Smiley Pruthi. In this video, I am going to discuss biochemistry questions of May AIMS 2016 exam. As many questions and topics are repeated, so I hope this video will help you. So let's start. Question number one, cyanide was taken up by the child. Which of the following is the first one to be affected in Krebs cycle? Options are aconitase, NAD cofactor, citrate and acetyl-CoA. So in this question they are asking you the effect of cyanide on TCA cycle. Cyanide directly does not affect TCA cycle. So this is a tricky question. We only know one, only one thing about cyanide that cyanide inhibits cytochrome oxidase that is complex 4 of ETC. So in cyanide poisoning ETC is affected. Now what is ETC? Starting molecule is NADH. From NADH we finally synthesize ATP. This is ETC. So when in cyanide poisoning when ETC is affected that means NADH will accumulate. So NAD of that cell will be depleted. Now let's see the role of NAD in TCA cycle. These are the three reactions in TCA cycle where we require NAD. So we can say that NAD is the driving force for TCA cycle. Now when NAD is depleted, so TCA will also stop. So NAD cofactor is the answer to this question. The first thing to be affected in cyanide poisoning is NAD. Now let's also see link reaction. In link reaction, pyruvate forms acetyl-CoA with the help of enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase. This reaction also requires NAD and when NAD gets depleted, acetyl-CoA production also decreases. So summarizing, when NAD gets depleted, TCA cycle will stop and all the intermediates of TCA cycle will actually be increased in this case and acetyl-CoA production will decrease. So now let's see the question again. First option is aconitase. This is enzyme of TCA cycle. It is not affected in cyanide poisoning. Second option, NAD cofactor. That is the answer to this question. Third option is citrate, which is intermediate of TCA cycle, which is actually increased. And fourth option, that is acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA production also decreases. So best answer here is NAD cofactor. As in the question, they're asking you which is the first thing to be affected in cyanide poisoning. So Acetyl-CoA and citrate, they'll be affected later, so best answer is NAD cofactor. Now moving on to question number two. Question number two is, which is not glucogenic? Options are acetyl-CoA, pyruvate, lactate, oxaloacetate. So in the question, they're asking you, which is not glucogenic means, which substance can never give rise to glucose? Your answer is acetyl-CoA. Your answer lies in link reaction that is pyruvate can form acetyl-CoA. This reaction is irreversible means pyruvate can form acetyl-CoA but acetyl-CoA can never form pyruvate. So acetyl-CoA is never glucogenic. You should also be very clear about all the other important things related to acetyl-CoA which are frequently asked questions. These are acetyl-CoA is never glucogenic. Acetyl-CoA is not the first substrate of TCA cycle. Acetyl-CoA is not the carrier of TCA cycle and acetyl-CoA is not the intermediate of TCA cycle. In fact, oxaloacetate is the first substrate of TCA cycle. Oxaloacetate is known as carrier of TCA cycle. Oxaloacetate is glucogenic. In fact, all the intermediates of TCA cycle are glucogenic. Substrates for gluconeogenesis are number one pyruvate and lactate they are glucogenic number two glycerol and propionic acid are glucogenic number three amino acids glucogenic category and both category that is both glucogenic and ketogenic category there are three types of amino acids depending upon the catabolic fate first is glucogenic category ketogenic category and both glucogenic and ketogenic category the amino acids which can give rise to pyruvate or TCA cycle intermediate they are known as glucogenic the other category of amino acids which can form ketone body or acetyl CoA they are ketogenic and we have the third category also the amino acids in ketogenic category are two that is leucine and lysine Lysine is in controversy. Some books say it is ketogenic and some books say it is in both category. 
so it is still in controversy so if both options given in some question your best answer will be leucine next is both category of amino acids are tyrosine tryptophan and threonine now threonine is also in both category so in fact it is very easy to learn that all the amino acids starting from t are in both category others are isoleucine and phenylalanine so all these we have learned the amino acids in ketogenic category and the amino acids in both category remaining all will be in glucogenic category in which main glucogenic or most glucogenic is alanine question number 3 all of the following amino acids forms acetyl coa via pyruvate dehydrogenase except options are glycine hydroxyproline tyrosine and alanine this is a difficult question so let's first see the basics now you know that lactate can form pyruvate pyruvate via link reaction forms acetyl coa which then enters tca cycle then pyruvate can also form oxaloacetate by pyruvate carboxylase oxaloacetate then can finally give rise to glucose by gluconeogenesis and also acetoacetyl coa that is ketone body it can also give rise to acetyl coa now we have to see in this this is cycle how which amino acid is entering at which step so let's first see pyruvate six amino acids enter at the level of pyruvate they are glycine alanine serine threonine cysteine and hydroxyproline then few amino acids enter at the level of acetoacetyl coa these are five leucine lysine tryptophan phenylalanine and tyrosine then at the level of alpha ketoglutarate glutamate enters and four amino acids finally give rise to glutamate they are histidine proline glutamine and arginine then at the level of succinyl coa we have four amino acids which enter at the level of succinyl coa they are isoleucine methionine valine and threonine then at the level of fumarate we have two amino acids tyrosine and phenylalanine then at the level of oxaloacetate asparagine and aspartate enters then directly at the level of acetyl coa leucine isoleucine threonine and tryptophan enters now let's see the question again they are asking which amino acids enter at the level of acetyl coa via pyruvate dehydrogenase that is link reaction enzyme so we have to see which amino acids enter at the level of pyruvate i told you there are six they are glycine alanine serine threonine cysteine and hydroxyproline so option c tyrosine is not in this list that's why that is the question answer. number 4 baby has hypoglycemia especially early morning hypoglycemia glucagon given it raises blood glucose if given after meals but does not raise its glucose if given during fasting liver biopsy shows increased glycogen the enzyme defect is options are muscle phosphorylase glucose 6 phosphorylase branching enzyme and debranching enzyme the answer is debranching enzyme now this is a difficult question let's understand how the answer is debranching enzyme In this case the first line in this question the first line is baby has hypoglycemia especially early morning hypoglycemia also known as fasting hypoglycemia that means this baby this patient is normal during the daytime and the gap between two meals is only 5 to 6 hours or 7 hours but when the gap in between two meals increases then the patient has problem that means only during the early morning time when the patient has 12 to 13 hours of fasting at that time patient has problem blood glucose normally in between meals is coming from liver glycogen let's see what normally happens in glycogenolysis in glycogenolysis we have two enzymes that is glycogen phosphorylase and debranching enzyme glycogen phosphorylase is responsible for giving 90% of blood glucose and debranching enzyme is only responsible for giving 10% of the glucose so in a patient if this debranching enzyme is not there then only this 10% glucose is not released but the 90% glucose given by glycogen phosphorylase which is normal so this 90% glucose is fine is coming in blood now let's see how normally glycogen phosphorylase cuts glycogen suppose this is a branched glycogen given to you so this glycogen phosphorylase will it is the starting enzyme which will start cutting this glycogen but this glycogen phosphorylase can only cut a straight chain but it cannot break the branch point therefore after the action of glycogen phosphorylase this kind 
kind of structure is left which can be really broken by the branching enzyme but in this patient this the branching enzyme is absent so this structure is left when this structure is made of limit dextrins so in these patients we have limit dextrins accumulated in patients liver during fasting that's why in the question they say that liver biopsy shows increased blood now let's see the role of glucagon in the question they are saying that glucagon given to this patient it raises blood glucose if given after meals but does not raise blood glucose if given during fasting now let's see the normal effect of glucagon the glucagon hormone always activates glycogen phosphorylase so it activates glycogenolysis but on the other hand it also inhibits glycogen synthase so it inhibits glycogenesis now in this patient if give, give if glucagon given during fasting then glucagon will activate glycogen phosphorylase but patient has limit dextrins which cannot be broken by glycogen phosphorylase so blood glucose will not rise if glucagon given during fasting in this patient now what happens normally in fed state in fed state because we have blood glucose so all that blood glucose will be used to synthesize glycogen so glycogenesis is activated on the other hand glycogenolysis is inhibited by reciprocal regulation so in this patient if glucagon given during fed state it will activate glycogenolysis so blood glucose will rise next is question number 5 all of the following can be used to precipitate proteins except options are heavy metals alcohol and acetone changing ph other than isoelectric ph and trichloroacetic acid this question is on the topic that is protein precipitation reactions which aims have been asking since last two three times so this is important topic let's see the basics this is the structure of amino acid amino acid has two groups that is carboxy group and amino group when amino acid is ionized carboxy group gives negative charge and amino group gives positive charge so on this structure net charge is zero this is known as zwitter ion so the ph at which zwitter ion exists is known as isoelectric ph the solubility of proteins is because of charges but at zwitter ion structure or you can say at isoelectric ph proteins are insoluble so precipitation occurs at isoelectric ph so how precipitation can occur any substance which causes denaturation neutralization of charges or dehydration all these substances will cause precipitation now let's see the various method methods of protein precipitation first is heat and second is strong mineral acids both these will cause denaturation and thus precipitation next is heavy metal salts in alkaline medium and fourth is alkaloidal reagent example sulfosalicylic acid trichloroacetic acid phosphotungstic acid both these number 3 and number 4 they cause neutralization of charges now next is organic solvents example ether and alcohol and neutral salt example example ammonium sulfate all these will cause dehydration therefore precipitation now let's see the question again options are first is heavy metals heavy metals they cause neutralization of charges next is alcohol and acetone they cause cause dehydration last option trichloroacetic acid also causes precipitation by neutralization of charges so answer here is option c that is changing ph other than isoelectric ph will not cause precipitation only at isoelectric ph precipitation occurs Question number 6 is mammalian genome contains maximum gene that code for receptors of options are odorants interleukins immunoglobulins and growth factors the answer is odorant receptor gene superfamily is the largest multi gene superfamily described in mammalian genomes question number 7 lipase that is regulated by glucagon is options are lipoprotein lipase this lipase is normally present in plasma which acts on lipoproteins next is hormone sensitive lipase which is normally present in adipose tissue inside the cells next is gastric and pancreatic lipases which are normally present in intestine glucagon acts on hormone sensitive lipase so that is the answer this hormone sensitive lipase is named like this because this is the lipase present metabolically which is which is activated or inhibited by hormones so let's see hormone sensitive lipase is activated by number 1 glucagon glucocorticoids catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine thyroid hormones growth hormone and adrenocorticotropic hormone
Next is this hormone sensitive life phase is inactivated by number one insulin, prostaglandin E1, and nicotinic acid. Now let's see the role of insulin on these two life phases. Insulin inhibits hormone sensitive life phase, but insulin activates life life phase, the one present in blood plasma. Now coming to last question number eight, that is the substrate saturation curve is given below, which is which characterizes the lost enzyme system. Which of the following statement is true? We'll see the options later on, but first let's see what is allostric enzyme. You can see this is the structure of an allostric enzyme, also known as regulatory enzymes, which can be affected by various activators or inhibitors. This allostric enzyme has one active site which will bind the substrate, and it has one regulatory or allostric site which will bind the which will bind the allostric. Now this allostric modifier can be activated or inhibitor. If activator comes, then it will bind that regulatory site. Then it will induce conformational changes in the active site so that now the substrate can bind. Earlier substrate was unable to bind only when activator comes, then the substrate can bind. Now if inhibitor comes, then it will also bind at regulatory site, but it will induce conformational changes in the active Side so that now the substrate cannot bind. The substrate versus velocity graph of normal enzymes is usually rectangular hyperbola in shape, but this same graph for allostric enzyme is sigmoidal in shape. This portion of the graph is because of the property of allostric enzymes that is known as cooperativity. Cooperativity means that when one substrate binds at the active site, then it will induce changes so that the other substrates bind with high affinity. That's why in this portion of the graph, substrate concentration is increased little bit, but velocity of reaction increases exponentially. So allostric mod modifier is not concentration dependent. It is not reversible on adding more substrate unlike competitive inhibition then allostric modifiers can change KM as well as Vmax hence they are divided into K series and V series. Now let's read the options of this question. First option is allostric modifier binds in a concentration dependent manner. No, it is wrong. Next is modifier can affect the catalytic site by binding to the allostric site. Yes, this is right and this is the answer. Option C is adding more substrate to the enzyme can displace the allostric modifier. No, it is not possible in this case. Then last is allostric modifiers changes the binding constant of enzyme that is Km but not the velocity. No, it's wrong that you know that allostric modifiers they can change Km as well as Vmax.